Okay, here's an information page for the Sophie seminar series. And before we start the official seminar, let me do a quick advertisement for the, the Sophie annual conference. This was announced last week. The 13th annual conference will be held in UC San Diego uh, this June. The idea is that it will be in person unless it's forced to go to go virtual or, or hybrid. So more information is available at the Sophie website. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the first Sophie seminar of 2021. I'm sure like, uh, like me, you're all hoping 2021 turns out to be better than 2020 turned out to be. But we're here, we've got a full semester coming up of uh, virtual talks. Today, uh, I'm very happy to have Renee Garcia from the University of Montreal as our speaker and Tyler Muir from UCLA as our discussant. We will follow the same format as in the past. We'll have 40 minutes for the speaker, 10 for the discussant and 10 for questions and answers at the end. Um, if you would like to ask a question during the seminar, you can do so either using the raise your hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or you can use the Q&A box and type up your question. And if you'd rather me ask your question than to call on you, just put that in the Q&A box and, and I'll make a note of it. Uh, we'll also have questions at the end if you'd like to wait and ask your question at the very end. Okay, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Renee. Uh, if you'd like to share okay. your screen, we can begin. Okay, um, so thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you all for attending. So this is a joint paper with uh, Jean-Sébastien Fontaine and Sermin Gungor from the Bank of Canada. And as the title indicates, I mean, like this is a, an empirical work that um, follows up on the other empirical work that connects intermediary balance sheet to uh, asset pricing. Our paper will be um, related uh, directly to Adrian and Muir in the uh, Journal of Finance 2014. So basically this uh, line of uh, literature says that while you know, the marginal value of wealth of inter financial intermediaries um, offers a basis to price assets in several markets and replaces what we are more used to, which is the representative agent type of uh, SDF that uh, prices asset. And so the intuition is similar in the sense that assets and strategies that perform poorly when the intermediary's marginal value of wealth is high, will offer higher return to investors. So uh, in the paper by uh, Adrian Etulain Muir, I mean, leverage uh, is used as a good proxy for the intermediary's marginal value of wealth. And this is, um, and the argument is that it is um, a good proxy when the funding or the leverage constraints are binding. And so leverage will decrease and the marginal value of wealth will increase when the funding conditions tighten since the intermediaries will reduce the level, either the level of the asset that they hold or the risk attached to them. And so in that case, leverage will be negatively related to the marginal value of wealth. So our paper starts by asking the questions, what if the funding constraints do not always bind? And um, most likely, I mean, the leverage may decrease when funding condition tighten, but the opposite is not implausible, right? Because if investors, if there is a shift in the demand for intermediation by investors and they want to sell assets, well, intermediaries may be led to increase leverage and that will tighten also the constraint and raise the marginal value of wealth. So in this case, leverage will be positively related to the marginal value of wealth. So um, if intermediaries constrained are not binding all the time, then leverage will be determined by both the supply and demand of intermediation services. So after a supply shift, Leverage and funding condition will move in opposite directions. And the broker dealer would increase leverage because of looser constraint. And following the demand shift, we'll have um, a co movement between leverage and funding conditions. And the broker dealer will increase its leverage to match, to match the demand by um, the increased demand by investors. And so, what we do to um, identifies these supply and demand shocks 
we use sign restriction in a vector autoregressive system of equations for both leverage and a proxy for funding conditions. So leverage supply shock will be the unexpected increases in leverage that are associated with better funding conditions. And leverage demand shock will correspond to unexpected increase in leverage that are associated with costly funding conditions. Now, in terms of asset pricing, supply shocks should carry a positive price of risk since both since leverage increases and marginal value of wealth decline, as demand shock should carry a negative price of risk because leverage increases and the marginal value of wealth increases. So let me um, show you first that this decomposition of leverage shocks matter for asset pricing. Um, I will give you the main, in a way, message of the paper right now, and that way we, given the message is, is given, then we can go into the details of the construction of the paper. So in this picture, uh, on, we have uh, plots of predicted expected returns against realized, expect, realized mean returns. On the left, we have basically uh, the model used by um, Adrian Itula and Weir with raw leverage and market returns. And for to draw this picture, we have uh, a lot of assets. I mean, we have portfolios of uh, stocks, portfolio of uh, corporate bonds, treasuries, and options. Okay. And on the right, we have the, the same um, graph for now two factors, leverage demand shocks and leverage supply shocks. We maintain two factors in each, on each side just to be, you know, just not to have different uh, number of factors. But of course, later on, we can add also the market to, to the supply and demand shocks. And so what you can see is that um, the, the fit is improved by separating the demand and supply shocks. So let me give you also a few more uh, details about uh, what happens, and then we'll look at it uh, in details later on. Well, basically the prices of risk for both leverage and supply and demand shock will be positive and negative respectively, as expected, and they will be stat statistically significant. But we would not be able to reject that the sum of the two prices is equal to zero. Only their signs will differ. So in terms of um, uh, pricing, I mean, like, you know, we still have two components that add up to, uh, you know, so in terms of parsimony, I mean, we don't lose parsimony, but it's just that, you know, the two, uh, the demand shocks and the supply shocks will have, Will, be, will have to be introduced separately. So the risk exposures will also be symmetrical. The correlation between the betas for these two shocks will be minus 0 0.65. And overall, this uh, suggests that changes in leverage that are due to either demand or supply shocks have opposite implications for financial markets. Now, this decomposition will also resolve some of the puzzles and mixed results noted by uh, Adrian Itra and Morn and others, both in terms of signed, sign, uh, expected sign for the for leverage, and also for the relation between market liquidity and uh, leverage. So we'll come back to that later on. So the, the outline of the talk, first we'll talk about the measures of leverage and funding conditions. Then uh, we'll spend uh, a bit of time trying to convince you that, you know, the, there is evidence that funding constraints do not always bind. And after that, we'll uh, show how to identify leverage supply demand shock in the, in the VAR system. And finally, we'll go to the asset pricing test and conclude on the relation between leverage shocks and market illiquidity.
So let's look at the measures of leverage at funding conditions that we use. Well, for leverage, we use exactly the leverage ratio that uh, Adrian and Mould used, and it is based on aggregate quarterly data on the level of uh, total financial asset and total financial liability of security broker dealers from the Federal Reserve Floor Funds. And I want to uh, make a remark right away is that, you know, we'll use leverage as a quantity of liquidity. And the reason we, we do that is that we uh, follow Adrian and Shin that show that leverage fluctuates through changes in the total size of the balance sheet, mainly through repos and reverse repos, and equity is a, being the exogenous variable. So in a way, leverage and total assets tend to move in lockstep. So we could interpret leverage as a quantity of liquidity provided. So we'll, I make this remark because later on we'll have a system of quantity and price um, and so I, I wanted to, to make this link between quantity and leverage. So for funding conditions, we had several measures that we could use. I mean, the older one, and then the one that has been often used is the debt spread, the spread between the euro dollar, euro dollar LIBOR rate and the T-bills rate. But we have also two proxies. One is the so-called noise, of uh, Upan and Wang, which really are deviations of individual bond yield from a smooth parametric curve that they estimate. And then there is a proxy that we created with uh, Fontaine um, and where we have a panel of uh, pairs of older and recent issues of US treasuries with the same remaining maturity and instead of using a smooth parametric curve, then we use a dynamic term structure model to uh, extract a liquidity factor. So just to be, um, to extract the information that is um, contained in these three measures, we just take the principal component of these three measures, but the average would have done exactly the same thing. Okay, so these are where, our two measures. And now we will go and try to find evidence uh, for um, uh, you know, the fact that the constraints, constraints don't always bind. So first, the naive approach where you look at the changes in leverage and changing in funding conditions. If the funding conditions will always bind, then, you know, these uh, two variables should tend to move in opposite directions. Well, I mean, you have one uh, big example in the second quarter of 2008, where leverage increases during one of the most severe tightening in funding conditions. But overall, there are many uh, cases where, you know, Delta Lev and Delta Fund will move in uh, the same direction. So overall, I mean, like uh, by just uh, do, doing the counting, I mean, we have about 58% that um, where they move in the same direction and 42% where they move in opposite directions. Now, the second way to, to do it, I mean, here it's kind of contemporaneous. What we want to do is to see uh, in predictive regressions, how fund today relates to leverage in the following quarters here, the frequency of our study is uh, quarterly. And then we look at leverage from H equal one to eight quarters. And if uh, the constraint will be always binding, then we expect that the beta FH in red uh, will be negative. And that the interaction term between the Fun, fund and the level of leverage uh, will be um, will be zero. Okay, so um, so this interaction term, in fact, is uh, essential to uh, 
capture how the partial effect changes with the level of leverage. And if this beta is not zero, then we expect it to be negative. So in the top panel, what we see here is uh, leverage at t plus h times this coefficient beta x h. And we see that it is, um, it is negative and it is significant up to the six uh, quarter, six future quarter, okay? And in the bottom panel, uh, what we did is to, we um, condition on the level of leverage and we, um, we measure the from two standard deviation for minus two standard deviation to plus four standard deviation around the sample average of current leverage. And so we can see that for high current value of leverage, when the constraints are likely to bind, then the partial effect of funding condition of future leverage will be large and negative as expected. Now, it becomes smaller and positive for low value of leverage. That suggests that leverage will be then the result of a mix of the demand and supply shift. So these are two, uh, I would say, reduced form evidence of the fact that the constraint may not always bind. And um, I want now to go to a more structural look at the evidence. And um, here, what we do is we specify a system of demand and supply functions where Lev will represent the quantity variable and find the price variable. But we allow the system to move between the constrained and the unconstrained state. So we have our two uh, supply and demand equations on uh, ZT variable for the supply and the XT variable for the demand and then the price in both. And then we have this third equation, which says that the observed quantity will be the minimum of the demand or the supply. That goes back to uh, an old literature in uh, Madeleine Nelson, 1974, and one paper that I wrote with Jean Jacques Lafont in 1977, where several methods are proposed to um, estimate the system where uh, you know, either the demand or the supply may be constrained at one point. And there are several proposed models where you can also use the so-called directional method where the change in price will uh, classify in a way the observations where uh, the demand or where the supply will be observed, depending on the fact that you know, it increases or decreases. But here we use the most simple model. And this will give us what is of interest to us, the probability that the observation left T will be constrained. So basically what we want to estimate is this probability by T, which is the probability that ST is less than DT, so supply is constrained. And by replacing ST and DT by their expression in these equations, then we arrive at the last equation where we have this integral, uh, that measures the probability that um, VT minus UT will be, uh, you know, uh, the measure of the probability that ST will be less than DT. And uh, assuming normality and uh, IID uh, variables, then we'll, uh, IID errors will arrive at uh, this expression where sigma square here is the sum of the variances of the errors in both equations. So uh, to uh, construct these um, supply and demand equations, we have uh, 
we include broad indicators of financial condition in the supply and demand equations, level slope and curvature factors of the term structure in both equations. For the supply, we add a measure of the money market mutual fund total assets. And we have two other variables that measure flight to safety by MMF allocation to time deposit and MMF allocation to treasury. And we expect the positive sign for MMMF, but a negative sign for the two other variables. And then in the demand equation, we add the uh, aggregate mortgage level and the ratio of the aggregate shadow bank level over the aggregate mortgage level. We estimate the equation by two state least square and maximum likelihood, but I don't want to enter into the detail, uh, details here, but basically I want to show you the probabilities that we obtain with, um, with this model. So basically, we see that you know, often the probability is one or close to one uh, most of the time, I would say, but there are periods where we observe zero or close to zero probabilities for uh, the supply being constrained. So we have uh, episodes around the 97 crash, the 93, 94 period of sudden increase in interest rates around 98 with LTCM and the recent crashes, prices, and the European debt crisis of 2011, 2012. And then we have also one or two quarters in uh, 2008 where we have this uh, probability of zero. And that's probably because you know, of the massive injection of funds by the Federal Reserve. What's interesting, I put below this graph the uh, delta fund, the change in, uh, in the price of liquidity. And we could associate um, you know, these periods where the probability of being constrained is close to zero to increases in delta fund or in a deterioration of funding conditions. And uh, if you look closely at this graph, then you will see that there is some kind of coincidence between these. And this also uh, tells us that, you know, these directional models that uh, people were estimating when the demand of the supply can be constrained are is useful information. But in a way, I mean, like we tried these several of these uh, specifications, but it did not add much to, um, to this evidence. And really what we wanted here is to illustrate that you know, uh, it's not crazy to assume that the supply is not always constrained and that, you know, we could proceed with um, a method that will isolate the supply and demand shocks. Now, why do we want to do it in a VAR system? Um, well, you know, I mean, like we want to have something that is not too dependent on the specification. For example, I mean, like this demand equation, the demand equation is not as solid as the supply equation in the, what we, um, you know, the system that we estimated the probability with. And, uh, and so, you know, we wanted to have a more um, reduced form approach. And also we wanted to have uh, structured, I mean, the, wanted to have some uh, unforgettable, unforecastable shocks in the, in the system. So basically we put then fund and lev in, a, in this VAR system. And so now we have to recover from the reduced form forecast error with variance co covariance matrix sigma u, we want to recover the structural shock WT. So we have this relation between ut and wt through this matrix b minus one. And the system, I mean, like the methodology here uh, is the idea of the methodology is to put restrictions on the b minus one impact multiplier to identify the parameters of the reduced form estimates. And uh, what we do is we use the methodology of Euling 2005 to 
uh, through the signs of the correlation that each shock will generate to identify the structural demand and supply shocks. So basically the restriction that we'll put is the following one. Demand and supply shock will both increase leverage forecast errors, but for um, demand shock, it will tighten funding conditions, but for leverage supply shock, it will loosen funding conditions. So there will be a, two different signs for the uh, supply shocks and demand shocks. So we have several results in terms of impulse response, variance of compositions, but I just want to show you the historical decomposition of these shocks. And um, so there are positive supply shock, positive demand shocks, negative supply shock and negative demand shocks. But I want to attract your attention on the fact that several, uh, you know, the positive demand shocks occur uh, in the period that we have already isolated with the structural uh, demand and supply system. Anyway, it's, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the approaches are totally different and yet it's a bit reassuring that we arrive at uh, some consistency between these uh, positive demand shocks and what we have isolated as periods where the supply will, uh, will abound. Okay, so I have uh, explained how we will get these uh, supply and demand shocks. And let me go now to um, asset pricing test. So for the asset pricing test, we'll use data on stocks, corporate bonds, treasury bonds, and index options. But we will construct portfolios that are different from the usual portfolios that people use. And uh, in that sense, we follow Bremer and Pedersen. They relate the marginal value of intermediary wealth. Um, they show that the intermediary, the marginal value of the intermediary wealth links returns with liquidity, aggregate liquidity, volatility, and funding liquidity. So what we do is to construct portfolios sorted on betas with respect to these three types of risk. So changes in aggregate market liquidity, liquidity, changes in aggregate market volatility, and changes in funding conditions. And so we have these betas for both stocks, portfolios of beta for both stocks and corporate bonds. And we add to that treasury bonds, constant maturity return for treasury bonds with maturity two, three, four, five, seven, and 10 years. And for option, we use the database of uh, Constantin index and R, where we have series of unlevered S&P 500 index call and put options with different strike price and maturity. So this is, these are our assets. And uh, let me now take you to the results, the estimation results. So the first column is the model used by AM, so we have row delta leverage and market as two explanatory variable. So we report uh, the T-stat of uh, Fama Macbeth and Schenken. And we also have two R squares, the sample R square, and then the adjusted R bar square um, from uh, uh, Lewellen, Nagel, and Schenken paper 2010. So basically what we see is that the first, uh, the first column, I mean like the, um, the results show that the R squares are not, uh, I mean the first that the price of risk of Delta left is positive, uh, significant at 10% with the Schenken uh, T-stat. And um, we uh, have an R square, which is not uh, too high and also a confidence interval that's quite wide. So now 
in the second and third column, we put the supply shocks and the demand shocks separately, and then we increase um, we increase the R square, and also um, the precision of this uh, fit with you know shrinking uh, confidence interval, and then in the next column we put both the um, supply shocks and the demand shocks. And that brings the uh, R square to 88%. And you know, we have uh, the both uh, are significant. Um, and the, now the uh, confidence intervals in, in, is quite tight. And then uh, we have this line H0 where we test if the estimate of the price of risk for the supply shocks and for the demand shocks are equal in absolute value. And so we cannot reject the equality of these two prices of risk um, in absolute value. And then for the next two columns, we introduced Delta Fund, which appears to have similar explanatory power by itself with the market. And this is not too surprising, uh, given the remarks that I made about the change in the price, and that's what also the inf and that's also the information we use to get the supply and demand shock. So the, there is uh, information there that um, also uh, carries information for asset pricing. And then when we put everything together, we uh, obtain we do not we do not increase much the the fit. And but all the variable remain uh, with the same level of significance. So now we look at each uh, category of assets separately, and that is quite interesting because now I mean equities appear to have for delta level alone a negative price of risk, and um, this is uh, quite surprising if we consider the original setting of uh, Adrian and Julian Weir because you know, we would expect that you know, if the constraint was binding, I mean, like, you know, the delta level would be uh, positive. And uh, by adding now the supply shocks and the demand shocks, we can see that you know, the demand shocks are, uh, provide a better fit and uh, are, the price of risk is more significant, but again, I mean, like we cannot um, reject the fact that they are equal in absolute value. But it's interesting to see that, you know, they have the right signs. I mean, the positive sign for supply and negative sign for demand. And um, when we put delta level alone, then the kind of demand uh, shocks kind of take uh, being more informative, the delta level will take the sign of uh, the demand shocks. Uh, the contrary, we obtain the contrary for bond. Um, since we have now a price of risk which is positive for bonds, but uh, we have uh, positive and negative again for supply and demand shocks, and again, we cannot reject the equality of the prices of risk. Now, um, the, here, the, um, the supply shocks seems to be more informative about uh, the pricing of the, the bonds. And uh, that's why Delta Lev comes up with a positive sign. Finally, we look at options, and um, here we have, uh, uh, you know, a negative now a negative uh, sign for the supply shocks, and this is uh, not um, what we expect. And again, I mean, like the now the delta level comes up with a very high. Uh, price of risk, negative price of risk, and that comes from these uh, supply shocks. But, you know, the demand uh, shocks seem to provide a better um, 
a better fit to these um, to these assets. And uh, when we look at um, the calls and the put, then uh, you know we obtain a reasonable price of risk for the call, but a very high price of risk for the puts. So maybe you know the uh, you know there is a different cost for uh, you know writing naked put or you know so I mean like the price of risk here is quite high. So since I have uh, about uh, three minutes to conclude, so let me. Uh, we do test, we do reproduce the results of Adrian and and Moore with the same test assets. And what we find is that the coefficient of delta lab is positive and significant, but only the supply shocks are priced with a price of risk close to zero for, um, with a price of risk close to what we found for all asset classes, but for demand, the price of risk is close to zero. And we discuss that in the paper and we show that the momentum portfolios are the, the culprit in a way um, in this basket of assets. I don't want to say more because I want to conclude on this relation between market illiquidity and uh, leverage shocks. So basically, Adrian et and Moore concluded that you know the leverage shocks were not really related to market liquidity. And here, what we do is we form portfolios according to the level of illiquidity in uh, one and for the level of volatility in two. And so we can see that, you know, for Delta Lab, I mean, like, you know, there is not much of a relation between um, Delta Lab and his portfolio, none is. Um, all the coefficients are not significant. They become significant with the right sign when we introduce supply and demand shocks. And um, so in a way, I mean, again, I mean, like it's this mixture of supply and demand in the Delta labs that kind of confuses the uh, information and results in a, in a basically zero relation between market liquidity and, um, and leverage. So let me conclude. Um, we, in this paper, we relax the identification assumption that intermediaries from the constraints are always binding and we provide some evidence uh, that uh, it is the case. And then we use same restriction to separately identify the two types of shocks. Leverage supply shock would improve liquidity and carry a positive price of risk while leverage demand shock worsen liquidity and carry a negative price of risk. Exposure to leverage demand shock appear to be measured more precisely in the stock market, while the exposure to supply shocks are measured more precisely in the bond market. Nonetheless, in both markets, supply shocks have a positive price of risk and demand shocks a negative price of risk. Now, what we need to do in this paper is to relate our paper to the recent literature which links capital supplies and demand systems involving financial intermediaries and household and the pricing of assets. I cite here three papers, Kojen and Yogo, Adad and Muir, and a new paper by Bertemier, Calvi, and Joe. And um, I will let uh, Tyler maybe comment on the relation between their paper and, and ours. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Renee. That's that's right on time. Thank you. So we'll turn it straight over to the discussant, Tyler Muir. Tyler, if you'd like to share your screen, uh, you can begin. Yes. This looks good. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much. So happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, excited to talk about this paper. Uh, I think it's a really nice paper. Um, there's a really nice uh, insight here. Um, and so, so let me summarize a little bit uh, the, the, the previous work here and, and where this paper is making progress. So the, the previous work, um, which, which has focused a lot of my own work, uh, argues that leverage for broker dealers is closely related to their funding conditions or funding constraints. Classic example of that is 2008, where we saw funding conditions tighten dramatically and we saw broker dealers massively uh, delever through that episode. Okay, 
So uh, my own paper with Tobias and, and Erco used that as an asset pricing factor said, well, those deleveraging episodes are gonna be times that are really painful for intermediaries, times with a high marginal value of wealth. And so that can be used as an asset pricing factor. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Now where this paper comes in is it does something that I think is very natural and that's a shortcoming of our existing work, which is, well, sometimes changes in leverage, decreases in leverage are uh, associated with tightening of funding conditions and sometimes leverage might decrease for sort of other reasons, okay? So sometimes a drop in leverage is a bad state of the world, which is what we care about when we're thinking about asset prices, good or bad states of the world, so to speak, or constraints tighten, and other times it might be a good state, okay? Or, or increases in leverage might actually be bad states of the world that push you closer to the constraint if you're not already there. Um, so that's the idea. And then the idea is how to separate uh, into these kind of two, two scenarios. So I like that a lot. And then, you know, at the end of the day, they're also providing really strong empirical support for this hypothesis in their asset pricing test. The signs make sense. Uh, their asset pricing model does a much better job once you account uh, for, for separating this. Okay, so let me, let me start kind of uh, back up even a little bit. Um, and, and talk through the logic of this intermediary asset pricing view and, and where this uh, leverage um, in, in asset pricing tests kind of came from. So the basic asset pricing view is that we have risk premia or ex excess returns on some asset uh, should be determined by their covariance with the stochastic discount factor, which is measured by the marginal value of wealth uh, in different states of the world. Okay, so assets that pay off in good times and not in bad times are gonna have higher risk premiums. And the, the, the standard or kind of classic approach to measuring the stochastic discount factor or marginal value of wealth takes this representative household or representative agent view. So that's where you get the stochastic discount factor being a function of things like aggregate consumption or aggregate wealth, the cap M or, or consumption cap M. Now, where is that equation coming from? It's just coming from investors first order conditions. Right, And so it's assuming that those agents are on those first order conditions for all assets at all different points in time. So we're making assumptions like everyone participates in all markets, they typically face low transaction costs, they can compute any dynamic portfolio strategy that you want. So if you're pricing uh, you know, options or momentum strategies or things like that, that the agents can kind of do all of that, uh, that they're optimizing continuously in real time and that they even know the return moments. So you can imagine, lots of reasons why that might not hold uh, for, for sort of the average investor or even the average house that might not even participate in financial markets at all. So the, the intermediary view um, in, in AEM was to measure the SDF based on the marginal value of wealth of a representative intermediary. Uh, specifically, we were focused on broker dealers. So now these, these assumptions with broker dealers being at sort of the heart of financial markets in a lot of ways make sense that their marginal value of wealth would provide a more informative stochastic discount factor. So this paper still shares that view where, where there's gonna be some divergence here is how do you measure that marginal value of wealth for broker dealers, okay? And in our paper, we mapped it directly to leverage. So the leverage of broker dealers measures their marginal value of wealth. That's gonna come from the Brenner Meyer Peterson paper, but I think there are some obvious shortcomings of that, which this paper points out. Now I'll also mention other work in this area has tried to map the marginal value of wealth of intermediaries uh, to, to other variables as well. Okay, so how does the Brenner Meyer Peterson paper work, uh, that model work? Well, basically, in that model, intermediaries are risk neutral, so that's important, and they face future funding or leverage constraints. Okay, now because they're risk neutral, they're always going to take the maximum leverage possible, they're always going to be up against those constraints. Okay, and so uh, the, the stochastic discount factor in that paper, which I have on this line here, uh, is that the, the risk premium is going to be proportional to the covariance with this variable phi. That's the multiplier on their future funding or leverage constraints. That's a so-called funding liquidity risk, as they call it. Okay. Now, in their paper, there's a direct mapping from that to their observed leverage uh, because that constraint is always binding. Right? So when fee goes up and funding conditions are tightening, they're forced to delever. Okay? Again, that's, that's because they're risk neutral in the model. There's a lot of other papers that kind of share some of these similar features. 
uh, Gina Kopoulos' paper, Groman Vianos, and, and, and so on, okay? Now, this paper makes, makes the nice point that I think that is far too strong of a view, um, that intermediaries are always going to be up against this constraint. Uh, leverage can decrease even if the constraint doesn't tighten, and it can increase even if uh, uh, the, the constraint is not relaxed, right? And so it's not always binding. So this is where they come up with these supply and demand shocks, supply shocks being uh, things that relax funding constraints and at the same time raise leverage, and demand shocks being things that raise leverage but actually might move you closer to the constraint, okay? And the price of risk of those things, whether it's a good state or a bad state of the world from the intermediary's perspective, is going to be different. Okay. So how do they try to separate those views? Uh, well, they're going to use this variable fund, which combines mispricing in treasury securities as well as the TED spread. So it's some measure of kind of funding conditions broadly. Um, and they're going to say, uh, if there is a, a big increase in the TED spread and big treasury mispricings, it's going to be more likely that, that the constraint is binding. Okay, so then they have this VAR with leverage and this fund variable. They use the sign restrictions to identify the shocks, and then they use the shocks separately in the asset pricing tests. Okay, I think the best example which Renee pointed to is if you look at so here's. Uh, change in fund and change in leverage. If you look at the second quarter of 2008, it's pretty clear that things are getting worse. It's pretty clear that that's not a good state of the world for intermediaries. And yet broker dealer leverage is actually going up during those during that period, right? So that's a clear place where you're seeing leverage going up as things are deteriorating, as mispricings are getting worse, as funding conditions are tightening. Um, versus the end of 2008, where you see the massive deleveraging and it's more believable that they're in distress. Okay, so this is how this is going to kind of separate out these two uh, cases. Okay, so in their in their asset pricing test, they also take a broader view of the test assets that they have. They add corporate bonds, they add options, and they do some interesting sorts within equities uh, as well. And you can see significantly increased empirical success in this. So here's in column one my own factor here. Um, so you know, positive price of risk, as you'd expect from theory, um, but uh, R squared only at around 30% versus when you do this decomposition into the so-called supply and demand shocks, two things worth highlighting. One is the prices of risk make sense, right? The, su the supply shocks have the positive significant price of risk, exactly as they would have argued they would. And the demand shocks have this negative significant price of risk. And now the R squared, the cross-sectional variation in risk premium you're explaining, uh, has gone way up to 88%, okay? So sensible implementation, significantly improved results. Um, other thing, I'm maybe a little low on time, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, the test assets that they use, I liked a lot. Uh, in our paper, we kind of use the standard off the shelf stuff, value, momentum, treasuries. I think they use, from the perspective of these models, more sensible test assets where we would think uh, intermediaries might be even more than marginal investors. So options, corporate bonds, and sorts within those asset classes based on exposure to things like liquidity, funding risk, volatility, that I think are really sensible, okay? Um, I have one minor quibble on that, which, which I can uh, even give them offline. Now, the, 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 the only kind of comment that I have here is there, there's this long discussion, and Renee showed these results about demand and supply shocks with kind of multiple what I would consider warm up results. So initially there's this emphasis on nonlinearity and leverage and funding conditions. Then they move to the structural supply and demand system with a bunch of additional variables to measure the probability that they're constrained. But then at the end of the day, when they really go to the asset pricing test, they're basically just doing this two variable uh, uh, VAR with the leverage and funding conditions. The nonlinearities, all that other stuff is kind of gone and out the window. Um, so I, I found it a, a little bit awkward to, to emphasize that stuff early on and then at the end of the day, do something that's kind of more, uh, more, more standard. So one thing I would like to see here is to just compare the results. So other people have used in asset pricing tests variables kind of similar to this mispricing uh, in treasuries that's, that's in this Delta fund is just to show what happens when you compare to using the change in leverage and the change in funding as two asset pricing factors. Um, how much of these conclusions do you still 
uh, uh, come to. Okay. So overall, I think it's a really nice paper. I think it makes a lot of progress on uh, the literature on intermediary asset pricing, where the basic idea is that distress in intermediation or distress in financial intermediaries is reflected in asset prices. Um, my own work had taken this uh, stronger view of leverage being one-to-one -one with constraints. I think this paper takes a more sensible and nuanced approach and then ends up with a lot more empirical success. So I think that's helping us make progress on uh, both understanding asset prices and understanding the, uh, the decisions and behavior of financial intermediaries and when they are in distress and when they're constrained and when they might not be. So I, I think both of those are really useful uh, uh, for this literature. Thanks, that's all I have. Hey, great, thanks very much, Tyler, that's, that's great. Uh, Renee, would you like to respond to any, this was mostly positive stuff, so I imagine. Yes, yes, I mean, say. so I, I, don't, I, I want to, to thank um, Tyler for his very nice comments. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, like, uh, we want to, to look at other assets and uh, especially, I mean, you know, relating to your paper with, uh, with Adad, I mean, like, you know, you show that, you know, the importance of intermediaries in some markets is higher than in others, okay? And here, the results that we obtain tend to kind of go in the same direction, both for uh, stocks and for bonds, right? I mean, like they will be more present on bond and then, you know, the sign will be, um, will be positive. And then, you know, in, in stocks, I mean, the negative sign appears and that means that maybe the demand side is more important. And then in your, in your model, then household will be uh, more present in these in these markets. So I don't know. I mean, like, uh, so we could go to the type of assets that you are looking at and see if these, uh, you know, uh, facts appear in other categories of assets. I don't know if um, what you think about that. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And and thinking more about this. Uh, uh, demand stuff, kind of modeling who the other agents are there and what's driving things, the Koi and Yogo stuff, uh, I, mm. I think would, would be would be nice as well. Yeah, okay. That's a little bit like kind of left hanging here, I think, but I think it's okay for, for what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, well now we can uh, throw it open to the audience. If anyone has any questions, you can use the raise your hand button or the Q and A box. While people are looking for that participant, uh, the, the raise your hand button. Let me ask you a question, Renee. I was curious about whether you could combine this sign based identification with uh, a nonlinear VAR type structure. Like you had these nice results with the nonlinear stuff in, in as Tyler said, the warm up uh, mm -hmm. analysis. Is it, is it possible to do that? Like this Jorda style model free impulse response combined with some sign based identification? Um, I don't know. I have to to see, but, uh, you know, because there are strong uh, assumptions uh, behind these uh, same restrictions and what you can get. But, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, like, you know, it's, uh, you decompose this, um, this matrix B and then you kind of create, you draw, you know, you, do, you draw uh, autonomous matrices and stuff. And um, I mean, it's kind of uh, computational. So I don't know, I mean, probably it, it is possible, but, you need to uh, adapt probably the, the, the current the algorithm. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, I understand it's very much uh, built on linearity. Like right. Also, normal yeah. matrix and all this other stuff. Right, right. But I don't know, maybe a, a regime type of uh, uh, could be a, a solution to that. Yeah, okay. So, conditional linearity, but nonlinear overall. Right. Yeah. 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 I see a question here. Uh, let me call on, uh, Dimitri has a question. Dimitri, let me call on you to ask your question. Oh, so I have a simple question. So I think uh, looking at the returns and explaining returns is very interesting. I wonder whether this model, which is more complex, also has other testable implications, maybe for volatility, maybe for something else, which will help us uh, to validate it. Thank you. Um. I mean, there is certainly um, 
the link between these conditions on the markets and uh, and volatility. I mean, we we introduce uh, volatility in the construction of the portfolios that we have. In a sense, I mean, like we put the portfolios where the betas are, you know, uh, measure the covariance between market uh, illiquidity, aggregate market illiquidity, and um, and the asset um, asset returns. But we could also, I mean, like uh, look at uh, other measures of um, of uh, you know instead of returns. But then, you know, I mean, it's a, another type of paper where you know I, I don't think uh, here we focused on the on the pricing because. But it's certainly possible that um, these uh, supply and demand shocks uh, are, I mean, they are associated with uh, different uh, states of volatilities. And, um, and of course, uh, now we can sort by volatility and look at, uh, at, uh, at, at the results. But um, yeah, no, I, I don't see, you know, why we, we couldn't do that. But, I, I kind of, um, you know, here it's really about asset pricing and um, in the in the line of what has been done before. But um, it could be an interesting paper to to develop. Okay, and I will um, I'll note, Renee, while you're answering that question, your co-author answered my question on the impact of nonlinearities, and. Uh, <laughs> The Q and A box, and uh, being the senior co-author, I understand you're not on top of every single nuance of the analysis. So he he said that when you included the nonlinearity, uh, the results were very similar. And so, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> you did not tell me. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, it's right on uh, right on midday, at least uh, here in East Coast time. So let's uh, wrap up the formal seminar. But before we go, let me do a brief advertisement for the next Sophie seminar. Next Sophie seminar will be in two weeks' time. Uh, we'll have Nicola Fusari from Johns Hopkins uh, presenting, and his discussant will be Elise Gurrier from ESSEC Business School in France. Uh, that'll be in two weeks, so please stay safe and well until then, and join us, uh, join us for the next Sophie seminar. <laughs>